Um, and look, we might uh, we might kick off proceedings. Um, so again, welcome to everyone who has dialed in uh, to today's webinar. Uh, this is a different uh, format webinar, and it's certainly proven to be very popular. Uh, it isn't necessarily just a single presentation. There will be a little bit of a, a quick presentation, but it's actually uh, aimed at being a really interactive discussion. And I encourage you guys all to get involved uh, with the proceedings. Um, I'm joined by and a, a very diverse and uh, esteemed uh, a panel, uh, including An Dr. Andrew Thomas from Cooks River Alliance, Ben Penelaric from Healthy Land and Water, uh, Daniel Arrida from Blacktown City Council, uh, and Lisa Dixon, Graham Lloyd, both from Sea Shepherd Australia. And of course, last but no le not least in any way, shape or form, uh, Murray Powell from Optimal Stormwater. Uh, just as a uh, FYI, um, the uh, Lee Bennett uh, from Department of Environment and Science uh, from the Queensland State Government was a last minute apology. Uh, and Ben Penelaric has been kind enough to uh, join the panel in Lee's absence. And uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, Ben has actually been working quite closely with Lee uh, Bennett in relation to this issue around the maintenance of stormwater treatment assets. So um, thanks for Ben to, uh, for stepping in at the last minute. And I'm sure he'll be very uh, qualified to uh, uh, field any questions that you might have had for Lee. Um, but look, very quickly, just some newsy sort of stuff while people are sort of dialing in. Uh, if you're uh, if you're not familiar with Ocean Protect you, we've been around for a while and now we're, we're actually turning 20, 20 years next month. Um, so a little bit of, there'll be a little bit of a celebration around that. Hey, and congratulations, and, guys. Thank you very much, Murray. And uh, if you recognize those two good looking roosters on the right hand side, that is Jeremy and Michael, um, our founders, um, way back when. Uh, and if you're keen to uh, hear their story, we actually did do a podcast with those guys on um, the Ocean Protect story a while ago. Uh, and that is a doozy. Uh, speaking of the podcast, uh, we're now 129 episodes deep. Um, and many of the panel have actually been on our podcast, which is a bit bizarre. And um, that was a doozy with uh, Dark, Dark, sorry, Garth uh, Covenant from uh, Canada about the human consumption of microplastics. A doozy. Uh, long story short, don't drink tap, uh, don't drink bottled water would be uh, the first step. Um, but yeah, really interesting. Uh, and if you like webinars, and I'm assuming you do, if you're joining into this one, we've got a couple of more uh, coming up um, on the 26th of May with Lockie and Photos uh, around maintenance of sauna treatment assets. And uh, after the uh, end of financial year in mid July, we've got Ian Adams uh, from Organica Engineering joining us to present about the role of buildings in sustainable stormwater management. So. The, the agenda today is a little bit different. Um, I'm going to try and set the scene for the, today's discussions, uh, and then we're going to dive straight into a panelist Q and A. And I'm hoping it's how I envisage this sort of session was kind of like a the SBS's insight program where we get you know a bit of a scene being set, and then we have a panel of guys and girls, and we basically just have questions being asked by me as the uh, sort of I guess uh, facilitator, but also from the audience. Uh, so if you do have a question that you'd really like to ask either of our panelists today around this issue, please uh, put it in the Q&A. Um, also, you are welcome to uh, virtually raise your hand. Uh, and there's a, you'll see a little button there around raising your hand. And, and, and basically, if you do that, I'll know you want to um, speak up and, or, or unmute yourself and, and show your video. So that, that'll be a way of actually you getting, essentially getting up, standing up in the virtual room and um, verbalizing your question or comment. Um, which the panel can obviously then respond to. Um, in terms of the panel, it's a, like I said, it's a really diverse um, panel and it's uh, really stoked to have such a great people, group of individuals. Um, there's Dr. Andrew Thomas, who's the executive officer from the Cooks River Alliance, uh, Ben Penelaric, principal scientist from uh, Healthy Land and Water, Daniel Ryder, who's the Wooster Compliance Officer at Blacktown City Council, Lisa Dix, who's the National Marine Debris Campaign Coordinator at Sea Shepherd Australia. And if you can't see Lisa, Lisa, um, that's because she's actually dialing in from the Cocos Islands. Um, so internet's a bit bad. So uh, she's trying to conserve her internet mojo by not showing her video, but she certainly is there. Uh, Graham Lloyd, who's the remote, remote Marine Debris Campaigner for Sea Shepherd Australia. And Murray Powell, of course, who's the General Manager for Optimal Stormwater. So thank you all, each and every one of you guys for coming on this panel today. And I should point out, look, our, our uh, webinars are extremely popular. I think we've got about 170, 180 registrations for today. And it's amazing for me how many uh, government and regulatory authority uh, groups are attending today. 
this gives you an insight as to, I guess, the various um, councils that are have at least registered for the day. Uh, and this, for me, highlights a few things. Number one, GeoWiz Australia is a, a beautiful and diverse uh, country. Uh, but number two, um, it's an issue, this issue around the maintenance of storm treatment assets is an issue that a lot of councils and regulatory authorities are very, very interested in for a wide range of uh, reasons. So certainly thank you uh, for everyone from those government groups who have uh, attended it today. And obviously we've got a whole bunch of um, individuals uh, from private industry as well, uh, which I really um, I won't show up because there's more logos than I um, could try and Google uh, this morning. So again, just a reminder, please put any questions in the Q&A. Uh, and if you want to speak with your audio and video, video on, just raise your hand and just wait to be unmuted. So, but I'm just gonna start off dropping some truth bombs. Um, so here we go. So this is basically trying to set the scene into relation to what we're talking about today. So number one, there's a lot of plastic entering Australian waterways and the vast majority of this uh, plastic pollution is from Australia. It's land-based and from Australia. Uh, and stormwater is also the number one source of pollution in our urban waterways. Uh, and look, a, a stack of stormwater treatment assets have been installed across Australia to mitigate the uh, impacts to waterway health and ultimately human health, et cetera. But the vast majority of those assets that have been installed across Australia do not receive appropriate maintenance. Okay. Now, the Storm in New South Wales uh, issued some guidelines for the maintenance of storm treatment assets a while ago. And I'm, I, uh, I know one of our uh, panelists is that played a key role in that. So kudos to Murray Powell. Uh, and I'm just quoting the guidelines here. It says a well-maintained storm uh, measure will operate uh, more closely to its intended design than a poorly maintained one. Um, they really need to be maintained. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing actually part of my screen because I'm, I'm seeing, let me just move my window. Uh, I'll, I'll requote it. Uh, a well-maintained storm asset will, main, will operate more closely to its intended design than a poorly maintained one. Measures that are not maintained are unlikely to perform effectively. Now, if I was to put it, a, a Brad Dalrymple truth bomb on this uh, issue, it, it's basically that to function properly, storm treatment assets must be maintained. And particularly, obviously, for the likes of the GPTs are, are, are around Australia. You know, if we don't remove this uh, pollution that has accumulated in this device, it will simply bypass, spill over, and incoming pollutant loads will essentially go straight into our uh, downstream drainage system and into our, ultimately into our waterways and uh, our oceans, etc. Uh, similarly for gully baskets, you know, it's obvious that these sort of assets need to be maintained. It's like an underground garbage bin. If you don't clean out the garbage from your garbage bin or it'll just spill over. Um, and we see this time and time again, it's certainly an ocean protect. Um, it's also, uh, it it's also relates to vegetative storm treatment assets, assets like bioretention systems, wetlands, et cetera. These assets do need to be maintained to, uh, to function properly and to function in a way consistent with their original design intent. Um, if you've picked up a music model, you know a bioretention system, for example, works a lot less if it's not if it's not draining properly, if water's ponding, or if all the plants have died, etc. These assets need to be maintained to work properly. Um, but is it illegal? Is it illegal to not maintain your storm or treatment assets? So. To answer this question, I actually asked a whole bunch of people, including a whole bunch of fairly well regarded stormwater professionals. Uh, and this is, so there's Murray, Andrew, Charles Kotha, Ben, Paul Dabowski and Michael Wicks. And these are generally their responses. It, look, long story short, it's variable, but generally yes. Um, but it's fair to say that the legality around this has never been tested in a court of law. And it's probably something worthwhile getting uh, a legal opinion on as opposed to just relying on potential my uh, Bush lawyer perspectives. So that's what I did. I asked a lawyer. I asked a lawyer around this very issue. Is it illegal to not maintain storm treatment assets? Long story short, they said yes. It is illegal to not maintain storm treatment assets. Uh, and I'm going to run through some of the reasons behind this. And basically, the uh, uh, I guess the individual state rules and, and, go, and, and legislation around this. And I'm, 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 I'm lim limiting it to New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, but it's fair to say that a lot of these requirements are probably consistent in other areas as well. So long, uh, first up, council conditions. So council conditions generally, typically do 
require these assets to be maintained appropriately. And I've shown you some examples. This just in here, this is some example conditions uh, from Blacktown City Council, mandating that these assets need to be appropriately maintained. Uh, now, if, I'm go if I just look at Victoria for the time being, under the Victorian planning provisions, under clause 56.07-4, uh, urban stormwater management systems must be designed and managed in accordance with the requirements and the satisfaction of the relevant drainage authority. And there's probably some weasel words in there, but it's certainly an onus on appropriate management of assets, not just putting them in, but appropriately managing them. And if you look at um, the Environmental Protection Act in Victoria, there is a, also a general environmental duty. And, and thank you for Andrew Thomas to, uh, for pointing this out to me, but there is an environmental duty that basically says, and you can see it here, a person who is engaging, you know, basically have to do whatever you can to prevent environmental harm. And certainly maintaining stormwater treatment assets is consistent with maintaining this environmental duty. Similarly, in Queensland, the Environmental Protection Act of 94, if you look at uh, what, chapter seven, section 319, there's also a very, very similar general environmental duty. Now, and you can see it here, a person must not carry out any activities that, is, that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes all reasonable and practical measures to prevent or minimize that harm. And maintaining storm treatment assets, to, from my perspective, and certainly the lawyer's perspective, is certainly consistent with uh, maintaining this environmental duty. Also in Queensland, there's the uh, Local Government Act. Um, and in Brisbane, there's a City of Brisbane Act. And long story short, the, the, their infrastructure, which includes storm uh, treatment assets, need to be appropriately maintained. Uh, and if you look at New South Wales, um, under the Protection of the Environmental Operations Act of 97, um, under section 116, it says here, a person must not willfully or negligently cause any substance to leak, spill or otherwise escape, uh, whether it's from a container or not, in a manner that harms or is likely to cause harm to the environment. And similarly, a section 120, a person who pollutes any waters is guilty of an offence. And pollute waters includes the uh, cause or permit any waters to be polluted. Now, I looked at that legislation and gone, that's interesting. I should probably just ask New South Wales EPA what their interpretation of it is. Is it illegal to not maintain sauna treatment assets? They said, yes, we basically agree with you. Uh, and this is the, what they uh, wrote to me uh, in an email not long ago, uh, basically saying, yeah, as you rightfully cited under section 120, et cetera, of that act, a person who pollutes any waters is guilty of an offense. But they also said, in, in parting, that look, if you see of any, if you know of any sort of incidents of where this is happening, let us know. So what did I do? I thought I'd test the waters uh, and basically become a bit of a snitch. Um, so I basically uh, tried to identify some sites where I knew assets weren't being maintained and I let the relevant authority know about this and just to see what, what, what they would do. So first up, I went. Uh, I got a, got a site, and I won't mention where I got these sites from, um, but it was a, a site in Northern Beaches Council, uh, basically a GPT and a bioretention system that wasn't didn't didn't at least seem to be getting maintained. Uh, pollution was overflowing from the GPT, and the bioretention system certainly seen better days, and is unlikely to be receiving any maintenance. Similarly, there was a, 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 a net sort of tech uh, GPT at the end of uh, a pipe in Liverpool City Council in Preston's that basically had fallen off uh, and wasn't doing anything, is not receiving any maintenance, not functioning properly. A bioretention system in Silverdale in Wallandilly Shire Council. And for each of these sites, I notified the local council, but also the New South Wales EPA. Uh, this is a, a, a supposed to be a bioretention system that probably isn't getting maintained at all. Similarly, uh, a couple of bioretention systems in Brisbane City Council, and so this one's in Lytton. Again, I contacted Brisbane City Council and, and Department of Environment Science. Uh, and similar to this one, this is in Tingalpa, a classic, classically beautiful bioretention system outside your favorite fast food restaurant um, in Tingalpa. And so what, what happened? So basically the Queensland state government said, look, thank you for letting us know, uh, but we pass on the responsibility around this sort of issue to Brisbane City Council. But if you're unhappy with the service you're getting and you don't think they're acting appropriately, uh, you can contact your uh, state ombudsman. Uh, so what did I hear? So long story short, it varied. Um, so Brisbane City Council and Northern Beaches Council, to their credit, got back to me very, very quickly um, and said they would investigate. And I've heard since from Brisbane City Council that they've essentially uh, decided on an educational sort of initiative to, to those two groups. 
And they basically said, if you don't see any improvements within a month or two, let us know and we'll go out and do something different. Uh, but in terms of the New South Wales, the EPA, Wallandilly and Liverpool City Council, what did I hear? Crickets, nothing, nada, zip, not good enough. So that's kind of set the scene. So I'm keen to essentially have a chat about this with my esteemed panelists. So just a reminder, I've got a, a, a very uh, esteemed panel of experts and you can see they're all smiling, eagerly waiting for your questions, <laughs> some more so than others. Uh, and we've got Lisa Dix also on the phone as well, if you'd like to ask any questions to these guys. So if you do have any questions you'd like to ask, here's your opportunity to do so. Um, so if you'd like to, again, a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A and I will do my best to sort of uh, make sure they get answered basically. And it's generally a case of first in first best. Uh, in terms of, but if you'd like to verbalize any questions you might have, just raise your hand virtually and uh, I will look to unmute your video and audio and you can essentially verbalize your question or comment to the panel. But uh, I might get the ball rolling first and Murray Powell um, with your amazing shirt, um, I'm, I might start with you. It's a lovely fish uh, <laughs> motif today. Always. Always. <laughs> but look, uh, Murray, if I could just ask you a, a question first up. So I've provided a bit of an introduction to this issue around, you know, assets, not, you know, uh, lots of assets in the ground, most of them not being maintained, et cetera. And obviously I've done a fairly um, quick overview of legislation. Now you're you're a guru in this industry. You look, you you know more about the maintenance of storm treatment assets than I think anyone in Australia. Is there anything that I've said so far that you would actually disagree with? No, mate. I'm in agreement with all of it. In my experience, when auditing devices in private and public ownership is the ones in public ownership where the owners are not trying to make a profit, i.e., for councils, they have a lot more. Uh, success and, and commitment to actually maintaining their assets. But the ones that are in private ownership, there's basically an inherent conflict of interest. Unless someone's going to give them a, a carrot or a stick, um, there's no incentive for them to actually maintain these. Uh, it's put a tick in a box during, due, during the DA process. These devices have gone in. And what is encouraging them or motivating them to actually maintain their assets? And at the moment, very little. I think this is, mate, baby steps right at the start of something that could be quite a significant issue for our entire industry over the next 20 years. Mm. Uh, you've, Brad, you've set the, uh, uh, the cat amongst the pigeons and, and given us a very good platform to move forward from. Um, and I think this will become a much bigger issue as we progress in, in coming years and decades. Um, if you recall, a while back, we had a massive problem with maintenance of stormwater treatment assets, which came after the um, Stormwater Trust funded $80 million worth of devices for councils back in the um, late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and then they did an assessment on how well they were working and found that right across the board, councils weren't maintaining their assets in accordance with their needs. Off the back of that, the Stormwater Industry Association uh, went to the government. I was one of the people that went along and um, there was five of us there and we got EPA support. And because of that, we were able to get up what we colloquially known as the stormwater levy uh, or the stormwater management service charge. Now that, you know, wasn't perfect in, in how it was uh, created. It wasn't linked to CPI. And obviously we should have built in a review process to look at getting that increased. So Stormwater New South Wales will take that on board and, as we move forward. Um, but I'm thinking this whole issue of the fact that devices not getting maintained, regardless of who actually owns them, um, maybe there needs to be stronger legislation. Uh, from what you've told me already, I mean, Queensland and Victoria seem to be ahead of New South Wales. We certainly need to lift our game here, but uh, maybe we need to lift it right across the board. Maybe it needs to be stronger wording in the legislation. So... Um, Put that out there for, for thought and maybe we do need to splash a bit of money towards a lawyer and then go and see ministers and, and see if we can actually get the legislation changed i mean 2006 we got the stormwater levy up in new south wales and it's funded millions of dollars that was all designed 
um, to be spent on stormwater maintenance. Uh, unfortunately, someone came up with a policy that said you should only spend 10% of it on maintenance. I don't know who that idiot was, but that was certainly never the intention. And councils have been spending the money on all sorts of things and not necessarily on maintenance. So uh, certainly I see uh, when we're out auditing, et cetera, a lot of devices not working due to maintenance and uh, we all need to lift our game. And I think this is a bloody good start setting up this webinar, mate. Thank you for doing that. All right. Um, so maybe we need to be taking it a little more legal and uh, seeing ministers with a request for change in legislation. Mm. No, thanks for the comments there, Murray. And look, uh, a group that certainly is no stranger to direct action uh, is Sea Shepherd Australia. Historically, they, they've rammed whaling boats and uh, obviously they, they do a lot of on the ground work. And it might be a question for uh, Lisa, if you can hear me, Lisa, first up. So people might actually not be aware the, of what Sea Shepherd Australia do, does on the, uh, in terms of marine debris. Can you give an overview of what actually Sea Shepherd Australia does in the marine debris space? Uh, uh, yes, can you, can you hear me? I can, Lisa, it's a little bit blurry, but I think we I think it's okay. coming through, all good. Yeah, the internet is so slow here, it's via satellite, and when the rain is around, which it is at the moment, it just slows everything down. That's okay. You are on the Cocos Island. It, it's not uh, Sydney CBD, so all good. We'll, we'll, we'll try it. See how we go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Sea Shepherd Australia um, sort of entered this space in 2015, where we started with uh, just uh, beach cleanups. Oh, it's, maybe, it's, Lisa, Lisa, maybe. It's actually, sorry to interrupt. It's actually pausing a fair should, bit. Uh, do it because yeah. it's so much delay. I think, yeah, there is a bit. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, there is a bit of delay. Maybe Graham uh, put you on the spot. Can you give, for, uh, given Lisa's uh, technical issues, can you give us a bit of an overview of what uh, Sea Shepherd Australia does in the marine debris space? You're, uh, Graham, and by the way, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in a row, isn't it? Um, okay, so as Lisa was saying, since 2015, um, when Lisa and Marina started the campaign, We've done over 920 beach cleanups. So we host monthly beach cleanups across Australia. Um, there's 21 teams currently in place. They're going out once a month within their locality, uh, um, trying to get as many people along to join us and educate them about the issues with marine plastic and then how it gets in the environment. Um, through those, um, those people and cleanups, we've removed 7 million um, pieces weighing over 115 tonnes. So it's just a disgusting amount of litter that's getting out and being removed. Um, we've had great support from the public with over 34,500 people joining us. So, you know, it's something that the public are, are well aware of and keen to help, um, you know, um, make a difference in this space. So, you know, to, to hear about the unmaintained assets is just so disheartening because, you know, there's a solution that's in place. Um, we know that 80% of all um, ocean litter is transferred via stormwater. Then 80% of that, again, is plastic. So it's the stuff that we're continually removing from the beach um, that, that we could be preventing by just maintaining these assets that are already in place. So from our perspective, we'd love to see change and get it legislated um, to help you know, help stop this litter and then we can, you know, we'd obviously continue the work we're doing, but if we can lower the amounts and we can focus on other areas, um, such as remote locations, which we also do, that are already inundated with other sources of plastic. Mm, yeah, thanks, Graham. Well, I might, uh, there's, there's quite a few questions coming in, but, uh, and please keep continue to do those. We will get to those. And I see there's some from Craig and, uh, Craig Bush and uh, I will come to those questions and and uh, Chris etc. I might hear from Andrew Thomas, who's never short of a, an opinion. Uh, Andrew Thomas, you might need to unmute yourself. Dare I dare I say? I hate to think how, where this is going to go, but look, Andrew, you've actually done a PhD on this topic, uh, yeah. Doctor Andrew. Why aren't stormwater treatment assets receiving the maintenance they need? Actually, I mean. From a legal perspective, because it's quite a complex uh, question, there's a whole range of issues to do with funding, to do with 
you know, different, a lot of it being uh, the responsibility of individual councils that have different political agendas and have different socioeconomics and different priorities because some councils are dealing with, you know, um, uh, low cost housing and new development where uh, rates might be limited and they've got different priorities to say a big council that um, in the CBD that's not only just collecting rates but a lot of money from uh, car parking and things that can afford to look at that have the um, a different set of issues and they can afford to focus on things that perhaps other councils can't. But from a legal perspective, and I've just been listening, so this has just occurred to me, sort of, um, but it's also something that I've been thinking about before, is that uh, uh, Murray was sort of getting to the issue of changing legislation, and, and I think that does, that does matter. But the most important issue from a legal perspective is just enforcement. Um, uh, there just isn't any as far as I can tell. And I'll make a disclaimer here or, or a statement here if anyone actually can prove, if anyone thinks I'm wrong, I'm happy to hear that. Um, but you need to prove it. I don't think there's been any cases, at least in New South Wales, where a council or a private organisation has been pinged under our existing legislation and you know, uh, for, for not cleaning out uh, a stormwater pollutant trap or maintaining a wussy type system. Um, so it's, it, it, that's the real question for me is about enforcement. Which then I then thought, well, is it actually illegal not to enforce laws? Um, because that seems to, I mean, your example where you went to uh, uh, the EPA and Liverpool and a couple of others, where you got no response. Uh, well, is that, is, is, that, is that illegal too? Is it, is it not legal to follow up those sorts of things and enforce stuff? So I guess the proof is really in the pudding, isn't it? Mm. And there just doesn't seem to be any cases where people have... Um, been uh, pinged for not maintaining a stormwater control measure, whether it be a GBT or whatever. But we do know, and I know this from the research I've done, um, that you know they're not being maintained. So we know they're not being maintained, but nobody's got in trouble for it. So that's that's really an interesting issue or juxtaposition, if you like. Yeah, interesting space. I remember in, in the state of California, I believe how the zero trash to water waste target came about. The local environmental groups uh, sued. I think Caltrans and I think the state government or something like that, which was the instigator for this zero trash to waterways initiative. So that might be something worthwhile uh, for, so for environmental groups to consider uh, or anyone really. Um, certainly the, and I should point out actually uh, a whole bunch of other regulatory groups were invited to participate in the panel, including Melbourne Water, New South Wales EPA, Vic EPA, and they declined the invitation. Um, and look, but in terms of uh, enforcement, and this might be a good time to uh, bring in uh, Daniel Ryder from Blacktown City Council in. And look, for people who, uh, a lot of uh, certainly stormwater professionals would be aware that certainly Blacktown City Council is, is probably one of the leading uh, governments in Australia regarding stormwater management. And um, so a question for you, Daniel, um, can you give us a bit of a sort of a, uh, insight into what Blacktown City Council is actually doing about supporting and or ensuring uh, or enforcing the appropriate maintenance of stormwater treatment assets. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm focused on the private property side of things. They're not really dealing with the public assets, but we're implementing a, what's it, a water sensitive urban design compliance program that is looking at enforcing maintenance on private properties that have water systems. And so this program is kind of built upon, I guess, three pillars which is the first one being compliance, because to have a compliance program, you need to be able to enforce compliance. And so we've been working on developing the systems, the processes and the materials we need to actually enforce compliance. And so I can go into detail about that, but I might leave that for a bit later. But so, well, actually, I might just talk a bit about it. Um, so yeah, creating a sort of system to manage the compliance, so keeping track of private properties with the systems compliance. And so we've developed something for that. We've developed a map of the processes all the way from identifying to uh, going to our legal team. So the whole process of all the different pathways that it can get to there. And also just materials, I guess the main material that most people should be interested in is the positive covenant and the restriction on the use of land, which is the legal foundation for our program, which gives us, I guess, the legal rights to tell people that they need to maintain that they need to report to us on the maintenance and that sort of stuff. Mm. We also uh, reviewed and improved our conditions of consent. So kind of improving them to make sure that people are doing the right things during the development process. So that during the operational phase that 
we I can actually enforce compliance on them. And then, so just besides from just having compliance, people need to be educated and engaged with. And so that's an important part of the program. And so we've developed materials and opportunities where we will be educating and engaging with property owners because yeah, most people don't understand that they have assets, what they're supposed to do with them or how, yeah, what to really how to comply with it. So we've developed web pages which have resources and information. We've developed our Wussard inspection and maintenance guidelines to kind of help people understand how to inspect and maintain their Wussard systems. We've got fact sheets to kind of summarize some of the stuff from the guidelines. And then we've developed uh, points throughout the process map that we've developed where we will actually engage through letters, through phone calls, through inspections, that sort of thing to kind of help them understand what they have to do. And then the final one, which we haven't done too much work on, but we're working towards is that incentivization and recognition component. So that's going to be the third pillar that we're working towards. And that goes towards some of the stuff that Mario was saying that no one's really incentivized to do the work. Mm. And so what we want to do is find a way to recognize people that are maintaining their systems and finding a way to incentivize people to do the right thing, which is to maintain their Wilson systems. And then yeah, cool. I guess also just to add on to that is, yeah, hopefully another thing we're working towards to help other councils because we can fix the issue in Blacktown, but we want to help others is to develop resources and opportunities where we can actually help other councils in the future. Cool. And just to Andrew's comment before, he was saying he doesn't think anyone has actually enforced or issued a fine for the lack of maintenance of storm trip assets. Am I right in saying Blacktown City Council has yet to enforce or issue fines for non-maintained storm treatment assets? While I've been at Blacktown, I haven't been involved in any, um, yeah, no fines or anything from me. Mm. However, yeah, we're in the process of, yeah, we've been reviewing the program, improving it, that sort of thing. That's been the focus more recently, but hopefully we'll be starting the program soon and we can start testing that yeah. sort of stuff out. So, yeah, so the focus is, I guess, on education first and foremost, yeah. and then, I guess, incentivization and maybe if it needs enforcement later on um, yeah. and look it might be a good time to bring in uh ben penelaric from healthy land and water and ben sort of uh stepping in uh people if you missed uh, lee bennett was in a late, late minute apology uh from department of environment and science and but i know ben's been doing a lot of work with uh lee and department of environment and science on this specific issue uh and i guess a question for you ben is um is there a role for state government in this space you know we talked a bit about the the state legislation etc um, but is, is there a role for the state government in the space around this, you know, ensuring or enforcing the appropriate maintenance of stormwater treatment assets? Dangerous question there, Brad. Oh, wait, I um, know dangerous ones, Ben. <laughs> and I certainly can't speak on behalf of the state, um, recognising that I am stepping in here for, for Lee. Um, yeah, no, I certainly can't speak for them and, and their intentions and, you know, and what they can and can't do. Um, but I think they'd be okay with me saying the following, and that is, of course, there is. So in Queensland, we have um, we have the state planning policy. Inside of that state planning policy, there is a water quality interest. Um, that interest is meant to trickle down into the planning schemes, which set the development sort of rules for each local government area across the state of Queensland. And uh, local governments have to embed that stuff into their planning schemes. Now, that water quality interest includes what we call stormwater management design objectives. Um, for post-construction or after the construction of, of development allotments, um, that includes, you know, for the people, for the technical people on the line who uh, probably, most, most of you probably are, most of you guys are probably familiar with stormwater management design objectives. They're the 85, 65, 45 pollutant load reduction targets or water quality targets that we have. And um, private allotments, um, if they qualify or, or, if, or if those stormwater management design objectives, post-construction ones kick in or apply to that development, they have to meet those in perpetuity. And in the front end of your presentation today, um, you know, it communicated that that's not going to happen. Those pollutant load reduction targets aren't going to be achieved and the stormwater management design objectives aren't going to be achieved unless these systems are being maintained. So we've got policy. Um, it's there. Um, the, state, uh, the state put it in quite a while ago. Um, it's being looked at to tighten it up so that, you know, we're getting better protections for water quality and not just water quality, of course, but also for waterway health. 
um, the policy is there and the state's responsibility as I see it is to, as I see it, sorry, is to um, uh, put that, well, yeah, put that policy in place, enforce it where it needs enforcing, though the local governments do a good job of translating that and, um, and improving it where it needs to be improved. And I can say at the moment that I think DES uh, are, are interested in doing that. So the Department of Environmental Science, and, and I'm very heartened by this, uh, coming from Healthy Land and Water, we have a very close working relationship with them, especially the Water by Design program. They, we're working really closely with them and they've indicated to us that they're very, very keen on, on fixing up or, or tightening, um, tightening that policy to get better outcomes, including and especially for compliance. It's something that they're looking at a lot more into. I don't have the answers. Um, for how you do it, uh, you know, I think that the role of the state is to um, is to set the policy. The policy needs to obviously the outcomes need to be environmental protection, but they also need to be meaningful and workable for local governments who are the people actually on the ground doing this stuff. And um, and so yeah, it, it, it's uh, and they're doing that. That's what I'd say. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for that, Ben. Look, um, I might open it up to questions from the floor now, and we actually have had quite a few come in. I see um, a, a couple of hands up. Uh, da I'm going to mispronounce your surname. Sorry, David. David Mitmans Gruber. I'm going to allow you to talk uh, whenever you like. You should be able to speak up now if you like. Just let me know if that doesn't work or if I don't hear from you, um, I'll probably know. But if you're, you're welcome to talk at any time, David, if you like. Yep. Thank, thank you for that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hit loud and clear, David. Excellent. Okay, yeah, now look, it's just one idea that just came up with this. There's similar um, issues that were had with backflow prevention. I'm a hydraulic consultant in, in Queensland and councils were having similar issues where backflow prevention devices were installed on cold water systems um, to protect, again, a drinking water supply. And again, they, got, they went in and then everyone forgot about them. So councils have now implemented a registration system where the installer has to register the device with local council. So then the council can keep a track on that device and, and issue uh, maintenance reminders to the owners to who are then uh, meant to maintain the system. So whether something similarly to that could be applied to, you know, stormwater treatment as, as well. That's, cool. That's, Thank you, David. Would anyone like to comment on that regard? I think, I think yeah, Daniel's the best person to respond to that. Oh. Put on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would actually be kind of a good idea to implement where they have to you know, register it somewhere so that people, so that councils don't have to try find and collate all this information. It will be provided in a clear and concise way that yeah, councils can utilize that information quite easily, and that would kind of help yeah build up that database. So yeah, I agree that would be a good thing and something I was just taking note down of to consider for my program. Yeah. And, and look, this, this isn't new. Like I, I think of septic tanks and rural environments, you know, you, you, you have to demonstrate you're cleaning them out and maintain them appropriately. And if you don't, uh, you get a knock on the door. Andrew. I just think Murray will be able to back this up, but um, Murray's done a lot of uh, audits at council assets. And I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Murray, but I think you've, one of the things that, one of the big surprises that councils have got, not just talking about the council assets, not the private ones, which is, different kettle of fish, is that they were surprised that they actually didn't know how many they had. Would that be correct? Yeah, look, it's, it's rare to actually do an audit and uh, not find new devices that they didn't have on their radar. Um, and when you do that, we very commonly find that some devices are non-operational due to maintenance, some are non-operational because they can never work hydraulically uh, where they've been put. Um, some are just, you know, way too small or, or, you know, useless. Some need to be decommissioned. Some can be recommissioned and upgraded and fixed, et cetera. But the big thing to take away here is you've got to have information on all your assets, like where they are and what they are. So it's very hard to know what needs to be cleaned if you don't actually have any asset database of all your assets. Now, Blacktown's sort of leading the field in this regard uh, in, regation, in relation to private assets. Uh, so people can obviously touch base with Daniel later or, or anyone else out of Blacktown and find out what they're doing to get information on all the assets in private ownership. The ones that are actually in council ownership, to a degree, are a lot easier. And councils do have maintenance budgets. Very commonly, there's not enough maintenance budget to clean them correctly. Um, but off the back of an audit, you can actually work out 
what you've got, the size of device, the size of the storage, the catchment area feeding into it, how much pollution you expect it to be catching, and then the frequency of cleaning. Multiply that by the cost of cleaning, and then council can go, well, currently I'm spending this much and I should be spending this much. But without having the justification knowledge of how much to spend, um, it's very hard to get additional money to maintain these things. So number one step in progressing this whole issue is good information on all of the devices and starting by the ones that are in public ownership uh, and then following Blacktown's lead with uh, trying to get information on the ones in private ownership because you can't regulate something if you don't know about it. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to uh, head towards some of the questions that have been written uh, and I'm going to just uh, take the first one from Craig Bush uh, from Blacktown City Council. And I think potentially Murray might be best to answer this one. Um, so Craig asks, who is setting the standards as what is deemed to be acceptable maintenance? Does the EPA have this standard of what is acceptable and what is not? Well, the EPA generally supports um, targets that Ben was talking about before, you know, 90, 80, 45, 45, that sort of thing. But they can't approve anything. Um, put it this way, they can refer back to environmental legislation that basically says, thou shalt not pollute. Now, I started my career with the New South Wales EPA, so I understand uh, their legislation and how they can implement it. The, the problem is, you know, virgin snow melt coming off the top of Mount Kosciuszko doesn't comply with, um, you know, not having any pollution in it. Um, you'll get atmospheric fallout and slight temperature differences, whatever it turns out to be. So technically, there's a bit of a, well, how much damage is caused by this pollution? And that's a bit of a gray area. Um, so it's like every time it rains, every piece of rainfall that turns into stormwater runoff is polluting. Um, yeah, yeah and that's to, try and, to try and get around it, obviously, uh, you know, the Stormwater New South Wales uh, did the operational maintenance guidelines to give a whole lot of guidelines and information and education on how to maintain their assets better. Because in a lot of cases, um, you know, some of the proprietary uh, O&M guidance was very largely uh, glossy brochures and not very helpful um, historically. So it's all definitely getting a hell of a lot better. And thank you to the proprietors who are doing a great job on, on lifting their standards in that regard, giving, better pe giving people better information. So we've got to know where the assets are. We've got to have better information and knowledge on how to clean them correctly. But then nothing happens without funding. So then it's a matter of we need to look at raising the stormwater levy and everything. But all this is still looking at only the ones in public ownership. And uh, at a rough guess, and I'm happy to take feedback from my other panellists here, I would assume you've got at least the same amount, possibly more in private ownership than you do in public ownership. Anyone's thoughts on that? I'll get yeah. You yeah, sorry, Andrew? I was going to say, um, I think I'm right about this. It really depends on the council. Um, some councils, this is this is goes to other uh, an earlier question. Someone I think it popped up and they said, why is there such a difference? And that is is the in a word fragmentation. And that's uh, if not by design, it's certainly in design of, of the way things are done in New South Wales at least. So a lot of this is left up to local councils in terms of what they require uh, in the development control plans. And um, well, some councils like Blacktown are very specific about what they require in terms of wussard and, and, and stormwater controls. And yet there are other councils that require nothing. And there's nothing, there's nothing illegal about that. Um, it's totally down to the councils about what they put in their DCPs. So um, I guess that answers part of it. I've sort of forgotten what the question was now, but yeah, the, um, that, that fragmentation issue uh, uh, means that in some cases, if that's right, you will get councils like Blacktown where you actually do have far more assets in private ownership, mm -hmm. but then you get other councils that have none, mm -hmm. uh, unless they're put in by the by by whoever develops the uh, builds a house because they like them. Mm -hmm. That's about it. I'm getting back to actually answering Craig's question. Then, yep. um, does the EPA have a standard or a requirement on how to clean these? And the answer is no. They've just got legislation that says thou shalt not pollute. Mm -hmm. um, if the EPA was to provide advice and information, you need to do step one, step two, step three, step four, and then there was still uh, pollution that left, they would not be allowed to prosecute because you had cleaned in accordance with their advice. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, they won't give advice on how to clean. They're giving advice on the outcome they want, 
but leaving the how-to up to the the owner or the cleaning contractor. Mm. So um, hopefully the O&M guidelines that have now been expanded to include Victoria and Queensland and South Australia uh, will be a big step in the right direction as to educating the cleaning contractors and making council aware of how to maintain their assets better. You know, it's all a big step in the right direction. But um, at the end of the day, we sort of need to be guided a bit on good policy. We need the legislation to actually back us up, um, which I don't believe is as comprehensive as it should be at the moment. Mm. We need education that, you know, the stormwater industry is pushing ahead and doing what we can in that. And obviously, we can do more. Um, and then at the end of the day, if you've got the legislation, the legislation and the education so people know what they should be doing and there's a legal requirement to do it still nothing will happen unless there's regulation and someone goes out either from council or from the epa and says guess what you didn't clean it you should have cleaned it here's your 600 on the spot fine and guess what it doesn't need to be a big fine even little fines will draw a lot of scrutiny and attention and get some big changes so yeah. but someone has to step up whether it's the epas or the councils to enact that legislation yeah look and there's a there's a number of comments and questions around this i'll i'll i'll, I'll refer to ruby ardren from northern beaches council and she says a couple of things so number one there's no real compliance for councils to adhere to apart from the big matters where they are placed into administration something like pollution would not be a big enough issue to lead us to a council being uh, censured it's up to the community to place pressure on councils and then they'll do something Another problem is that councils in the community are still generally not informed enough about stormwater pollution. There's a reason councils so much attention on roads, bins and parks. It's because the community are constantly asking for these things to be addressed. Mm. Mm. Ruby's right. I mean, there's a, it's stormwater's underground, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and it goes into a creek and it flows away. Uh, and in a lot of cases, owners, especially private um, stormwater treatment devices, they view it as a cost with no benefit. So, so probably a good question for Graham. So Graham, you, you mentioned before hmm. you do a lot of, I guess, on the ground community education and obviously a whole bunch of people are picking up litter. Do the community know where it's coming from? Do they, do they make the connection between stormwater uh, and the, the litter they're picking up? And I guess the secondary question is the, the, the councillors and mayors, like you had Dom, Tom Tate there a couple of weekends ago, do they, do they really care enough about pollution? Yeah, I think that most people don't realise that it comes from stormwater. We have lots of conversations um, with people, you know, lots of people come past while we're having these public cleans or doing outreach um, events like we did with the Waves of Change screening. Um, and, you know, they're just not aware of where it's coming from. A lot of people just think it's, it's you know, escaped or from bins or it's coming from, you know, other sources that a lot of people like to blame from overseas. But um, we're trying to work on that currently with people and educating them on them. In regards to the councils, I think that a lot of them are understaffed with what they're trying to do. You know, we, we speak to a lot of people on the ground in small teams that are, you know, doing the best they can to keep to keep the parks and, and, and remove this litter. But, you know, without additional funding and where, without enforcement, which is what I think most people are saying here, is that it's not going to change. You know, we, we need that enforcement to make it change. And, you know, I think we can all work together to help educate people about the issue with stormwater. I guess a, a comment that's come through a couple of times, I'll, I'll quote Myrna L. Moss. Emma, Myrna L. Myrna Moslemani. Thank you, Murray. <laughs> uh, they asked, they, they said, how do we force I'm not sure who this would go to. It might be, might be one for Andrew or Daniel, maybe, or, or Ben. How do we force private property and businesses uh, owners to maintain their devices if many councils cannot and do not uh, have enough funding to maintain their own devices? Just like council, businesses are struggling with the cost of operating their own businesses, let alone maintain these devices handed down to them from money-grubbing developers who most of the time do not build them properly. Wow. <laughs> so I guess the key thing is how does council enforce the maintenance of assets when that council don't maintain their own assets? Who would like to comment on that one? Oh, I'll have a crack. Good one. Um, Andrew. And then I'll hand on to Daniel. <laughs> the system that Blacktown has got, uh, is, is developing is how you do it. Um, how do you justify it when your council isn't doing it itself? It's a bit of a sticky question, but it goes deeper to what was mentioned by perhaps I think it was Graham mentioned before. 
are we being fair dinkum about, you know, we've, we've made local councils responsible for these measures, but uh, has have they been appropriately given the mechanisms to fund that properly? So, and um, with, with Blacktown and Daniel Ryder's program, um, Blacktown is uh, better off than many councils in terms of what they're bringing in because of the development that's going on there. It's a, it's a major development area and, and they've got some money to spend. Um, so Daniel's or Blacktown's council is the way you do it. But again, it goes back to that question is, do you have the resources to fund the development of such a program and then to run it? And that's the main bit I wanted to say. Have you got anything to add there, Daniel? Yeah, I guess the thing is I am developing a model and implementing that for private property, but at some point that is something councils could implement on their own assets so that like, yeah, taking parts of that and using that to make sure that they are maintaining it to the right uh, appropriate standards. And yeah, I guess resourcing is a thing and that's why I guess I'm trying to find ways to make it as cost effective as possible. And so yeah, it's just trying to find a balance between what we're doing with private, but then you're balancing it out with councils, budgeting and resources and that sort of stuff. I guess um, it'd be fair to say that council really need to maintain their assets before they start enforcing maintenance of private only, privately owned assets. Yeah, and like yeah. Blacktown is kind of starting to work in that, they are working in that space and they are developing things. And when Ben was there, he was working on some of the more public side of things. And I'm not sure if he has anything to say to that, but um, yeah, like, yeah. Cool. Well, I might uh, charge onto another comment uh, from Sarah Joyce. I'm, I'm not even sure who would be best to uh, respond to this. Um, and I'll, and I'll preface this by saying New South Wales EPA, I've personally made them aware of this issue many, many times and invited them to be a panellist and attend this one. So I'm not sure if anyone actually from New South Wales EPA ended up attending this one. But Sarah Joyce says, and I think Sarah's from the Sydney Coastal Councils Group. Um, it, uh, Sarah says, in New South Wales, without, any, without an agency taking responsibility or accountability for this issue, we will continue to struggle. It is simply not a focus of the EPA, EPA right now. They're more focused on litter prevention activities and leave it to councils to manage their own devices. It's unlikely for the EPA to prosecute councils when it is trying to establish a more collaborative partnership with councils. It is also not in their strategic plan when it should be. This is where I think we should start. Would anyone like to comment on that? I think Sarah's uh, spot on. I think she's nailed it. EPA have a policy that basically says we want to educate rather than regulate. Um, but that can't be the only, the only stance they take. They will have to look at regulating. And I'll tell you what, you can get a lot of education out of the regulation. Um, many years ago, obviously, Brisbane City Council had a massive issue with sedimentation and erosion control on building sites. They warned everyone. They went around six months later, busted half of them. Here's your $600 on the spot fine. Now, that's not going to send a contract to bust. But I tell you what, it really got them to stand up and take attention and start putting in the measures that they were supposed to. Yeah. Maybe we need a little bit of regulation to um, you know, get people to wake up. Yeah, uh, I see that as the role of the EPA. I don't think that's... I think councils have got enough on their plate. Um, I would like the EPA to stand up. Um, I'd love to hear more back from them. I'm disappointed they haven't been involved. Mm. Yeah, certainly. I think off the top of my head, I think... Uh, erosion sediment control compliance uh, went from, I think, 13% or 3% in, in Brisbane uh, to something like 90% plus just after they uh, hired two uh, staff to go around and essentially educate and issue fines. So it certainly does work. Uh, we're not uh, reinventing the wheel here. Um, uh, Sam, uh, I'll, I'll, go to, I'll go to actually, uh, yeah, Sam Neil had a question. Uh, they say, I would suggest that changes in legislation inherently have to be assisted by public interest and demand. Unfortunately, not all people subscribe to the belief that protecting the environment is inherently good. If the problem of pollution can be translated into the inherent health consequences, this would likely gain more traction. Moreover, if the public were to be made aware that hundreds of millions of dollars of publicly funded treatment assets were sitting around effectively rendered useless by lack of maintenance, outrage and further public demand would likely follow. Anyone want to comment on that? A Good round one. of applause generally, yeah. Sam. You'd probably yeah. appreciate the converted. And this is probably where I think the storm industry does need to step up um, and, uh, dare I say, stop talking to each other. 
Uh, and that is one of the advantages of sort of having the likes of Sea Shepherd Australia involved, you know, that they are very good at, um, you know, public campaigns, you know, raising the attention and awareness around various issues uh, where, you know, sometimes we've turned a blind eye to that in the past. And dare I say, we, we need to get in the media. We've got to start doing webinars and, and position statements and just get on the phone to the likes of Tracy Grimshaw and whoever, whoever the Channel 7 or whatever equivalent, get, on, get ourselves on the project. I'm sure we'd love to. Um, I'll charge on unless anyone has any comments on that at all. Um, a question from uh, Lachlan Gad uh, to you, Daniel. Uh, Lachlan says, uh, on private property, Wusserd rainwater tanks are an option uh, from a systems up approach from storm to improve stormwater. Basics requires rainwater tanks. However, in many cases, sorry, however, in many cases, the pumps are turned off, making them pointless. Is this type of issue regarding compliance on private property? Um, yeah, so that would be something that we would be trying to pick up during inspections or the maintenance reports coming through or even through our own inspections that we conduct. But yeah, we would be checking if pumps are turned on and things are working properly. Yeah, cool. That seems like a pretty simple thing to do. Um, Rob Booker from Sunshine Coast Council uh, says, as I understand it, we do not need to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, there are overseas examples where private sites pay to discharge stormwater. If they have treatment devices installed and can demonstrate that they have maintained it, then they pay a lower rate. If no devices or cannot demonstrate that they are maintained, then they pay a higher rate. Is this something that um, we could consider? Is this, is this something that maybe uh, Blacktown City Council, is this kind of what you guys are looking to do? Is that a fair assumption or? I, we are, I haven't spent too much time looking at this sort of thing, but it is an idea that like I have shared with Ben and Ben has shared with me kind of thinking ways to incentivize with your lower rates or something like that. But yeah, it's a very early days on that side of things. So we don't really have. Sorry, Andrew. To on Something to add to this, and uh, Murray or others may correct me if they disagree, but fundamentally you're only with the stormwater service charge we've currently got, it's not that much money. So it's too low already. It needs to be higher, first of all, to cover the cost of actually maintaining public systems mm -hmm. and if you were to disconnect then you would see a reduction and that would be worth something so you'd first need to fix the extraordinarily low amount that people pay um, for their stormwater particularly commercial sites and industrial sites and then that might be an option for us but first we need to address the fact that it's simply not high enough. Andrew you make a very good point here and that is um, one note I wanted to quickly put in and that is if we make it illegal not to maintain your assets but you don't, re, you don't monitor it, so you don't know that it's not working. Is it illegal not to monitor and not to know? Is, um, oh, sorry, Your Honour, I, I didn't monitor, I didn't check it, therefore I didn't know, so I'm, guilt, I'm not guilty because I, I'm innocent, I didn't know. Um, or is that just negligence and it still gets picked up? But um, damn, now I've forgotten what you were actually asking me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a long day. Um, I, I might I might charge on to uh, a question or a comment from it's probably uh, is you you touched on this before Murray in relation to the polluting who is actually the polluter you said there's you know pristine water from the hills of uh, the Falls Creek is be, could be considered pollution and and Louise Dutton says uh, legally speaking the question is who is doing the polluting. The lack of maintenance reduces the treatment effectiveness of the asset, but would it be considered polluting in and of itself? The pollution occurs upstream of the treatment device. Ah. Yes. Or Andrew, uh, would you like to have a crack at this? Andrew, I don't know, maybe, I'm sort of, this is just comes out of the top of my head. So I, I could be completely wrong, but that's an interesting question to see what happens in Victoria with your general environmental pollution, which you uh, put up before. Yeah. You could make an argument that even if that was the case, a council or a private person, a, a, a private property that hasn't maintained their device, hasn't met the general environmental duty in Victoria. Uh, in New South Wales, mm, God knows. Look, I think it's fairly clear that New South Wales EPA, uh, the POE, uh, POEO Act said you can't uh, let pollution or uh, you know, be released from a container. And then I asked the New South Wales EPA, Okay, it can, is it illegal to not maintain assets? And they said, yes, it is illegal to not maintain assets. For me, you, know, you, can, get, you can get caught in the reeds and, and go into the detail, but if, if the New South Wales EPA is saying it's illegal, at least in New South Wales, it's illegal. Um, so I, I think we need to move past this 
legality issue and actually just enforce it if i'm honest i i find it staggering i'll give you an example i find it staggering i can park my street park my car in the street outside my house for a day and i'll get a probably a hundred dollar fine yet i can have assets in the ground for decades and no one cares and and knowingly release pollution just downstream what why can i act illegally in a very minor way by parking my car at the front of my house and get a fine almost guaranteed, but I can knowingly release pollution into the environment and not, nothing happens. My, Andrew, I seems talking a bit to <laughs> talk to this. Can I play the devil's advocate here? Sure. With that question, I'm not sure if this is logical, but we'll see what happens. No, we'll, we'll see. The, could, we, could we make an argument then that councils would be better off not building GPTs? Because if they didn't build them, then they wouldn't have to maintain them. And, they would, and then therefore the person who polluted was responsible for the council's work. Yeah, but they still have a, a legal responsibility to protect and enhance the, the health of their waterways. Mm -hmm. So if they're not putting in assets to do that... Well, there's a lot of councils aren't. Well, that's my point. They're, they're, yeah. they're probably uh, not doing a good enough job to protect and enhance their... Uh, See, I'd argue health. that they could get away with that, but I'm not a lawyer, but that's just my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. but, you know, there's no... You'd, ha you'd have to chase the law around and around in circles to try and prove that not putting them in was illegal, yeah. in New South Wales at least. And if I could just interject, I think... Um, Look, there's, I think there's a place for us to be a little bit more um, ambitious, for sure, um, and, you know, kind of calling things out. But I think we don't really get very far by pointing fingers as well. You know, I know in conversations that I've had with people, um, the, panel, the people in this panel right now, like in the panel right now and other people in the industry, um, you know, the, it's often the case that we'll say, oh, the state's to blame or the, there's no federal government representation or local governments are lazy and, you know, damn the property owners because they don't know about it or care about it and stuff like this. That's literally pretty much everybody that's involved in, um, in this stuff. And if everybody's to blame, then nobody wins, do they? <laughs> so I feel like, you know, we, we probably need to, there's certainly a, a time and a place to call things out. Um, but I think it's about, it's changing the narrative of this discussion, not that, not the discussion we're having now, but the ones that have happened before this, that have maybe led to this one, to one where we go, yeah, we've got a big problem here. Um, it involves all of these stakeholders. How can we collectively work together to, to resolve it? Recognizing that perhaps the responsibility is less, is, is more ambiguous, um, than we, than we thought it's kind of on everybody. Yeah. Um, how, do, how do we do that? Yeah, the, um, we started, uh, just to give a quick plug for the Frank Sydney conference that we just had back in, at the end of March, um, we had a panel session with the Sydney Institute of Marine Science and universities and Alluvium um, and also Blacktown City Council where uh, delegates who were attending were able to ask questions about, you know, um, how, how to advance, um, uh, how to make stormwater more blue-green, if you like, was the name of it. Um, and one of the key issues that leading to what Ben said is that leadership was raised and someone turned the question around and said, rather than look at state government or blame developers, maybe we're not doing enough as a group working together. And um, the Frank concept uh, is actually developed to help address that situation about helping us as a group work together better to, to actually advocate, and which we haven't been doing as a group very well at all. And maybe, maybe, maybe at least some of that blame is on us. For not advocating together properly, like bringing the shepherds in and, and, and others on, into this frank group. And we're doing that white paper from the panel, which I'll, I'm trying to get um, drafted, and then we're going to have a workshop with those groups and then put it out to the industry to critique. But we need to start thinking about how we work with people like shepherds and the Sydney Institute of Marine Science and other people beyond the stormwater industry so that we can have a louder voice, so that we can be heard at the policy, um, in the policy debate which at the moment is um, more with other, other groups that have much more money than we do, like developers, but perhaps not the credibility that we have that we're not using. I hope that made sense. Cool. And look, and that might be a good time to try and wrap up. And I just I brought the screen up because I just want to recognize the fact that we've got a lot of different, th these are all the different uh, council and government uh, groups that have actually uh, registered and attended this uh, webinar today. It, uh, the, the point I made earlier is that a lot of people are very interested in this issue in particular. And I guess in terms of collaborating together, look, look, I think between us as a panel, 
And I guess I can, I'm can. i more happy to be the, the contact uh, for people who are interested. If you are keen to see if we can collaboratively work together on resolving this issue, dare I say, raising more uh, public attention, uh, educating the community, and getting more media attention around this issue and potentially the possible solutions, please contact me uh, or any of the panelists here. Um, and I, I'm certainly not just looking to sort of just ha and have this as a standalone webinar and just, uh, and that'll be the end of it. I'm certainly keen to move forward and progress action on this issue. And I think it's, again, I think it's great the likes of Sea Shepherd Australia and other environmental groups um, are keen to be involved in this regard. Just a very quick plug for a couple other web, up web, web, other upcoming webinars. Um, we've got a couple uh, coming up. If you're keen to know more and register, jump on the Ocean Protect website uh, there. Uh, I, I think it, just in closing, I'd really like to thank uh, everyone who's actually attended today. Uh, there's been another, I think we had uh, 180 something registrations. Um, and I'd certainly like to put a shout out to the esteemed uh, panel that have uh, given up their uh, time and expertise today. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, love your enthusiasm and passion and expertise in this space. And I look forward to actually uh, appropriately addressing this issue as a collaborative uh, group um, uh, and uh, see some real uh, action and improvement in this area. So in that regard, thank you so much again for your time. Um, any final words, gentlemen? And or Lisa on the phone? Lisa, are you there? No, she's muted. <laughs> I'll talk while she's muted. Um, look, just to wrap up in 10 seconds, what I'm taking away from this is largely we need to have a look at policy and legislation to help us in that regard. Education of people in what to do and how to do it. So a few tools to assist them. We need a carrot, which maybe that's additional funding to, uh, you know, or maybe it's positive media for people who are doing the right mm. things, et cetera, mm. free marketing for their company or whatever it turns out to be. But we also need a bit of a stick, uh, and that is the regulation which seems to be missing from the toolbox at the moment. Mm. So great great minds think alike, Mario. I literally wrote down exactly the same thing. <laughs> but I wanted to, I wanted to, I said good policy that supports local governments to do compliance, good practice supported by good, ed, good training and resources, not unlike your guideline, mm -hmm. good public education, including what these assets are, where they are, and why they're important. Good incentives, but like as you point out, Andrew, you, you can't. You, you have to fix up the stormwater management service charge before you can contemplate reducing it to incentivize people to comply. Mm. Good enforcement, which means local governments need to be a resource to actually do compliance. And you know, on their front, they need good asset management and all of that. What I was thinking, though, this goes back to my comment before. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders in there. There's state government. There's the people on the ground doing the actual works. Um, there's uh, industry groups providing the education and training and resources to do for those people. There's um, people going out to the public to educate them about that stuff. There's um, the local government compliance officers and stuff like that. And then there's the local governments, you know, themselves, the asset managers and everything like that. It's a big group of people and they all have to come together. So I think, I think if this, this little webinar is called for anything, it's called for perhaps another webinar or an industry event that pulls together all of those people to nut this out in a proper way than just the hour that we've given it today. So I encourage everybody to kind of approach Brad or whoever it is to try to make that happen. And just for me, the leadership thing again, if you think there's a leadership vacuum, and I think there is, you might want to start with a mirror. Cool. Again, we might need to wrap up now. Oh, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. My internet's a little yes. bit unstable. Might sorry, be my... sorry, can, oh, sorry, can you, can you, sorry, you, can you hear me or not? It's we just, can, yeah, yeah. I think that also there needs to be a good reason for councils and for owners of the stormwater drains <clears throat> to actually want to implement any mm. change and that mm. comes with exposure. And I think exposure of this issue is one of the very important issues because people do not know that stormwater drains pollute into the ocean. Yeah. I've seen that so many times. Even I was shocked when I first found out. I couldn't believe it because you naturally think that all of these assets are well maintained because, hey, what's the point of having them? Just let it go out, you know, if they're not maintained. So you just assume as a member of the public that, yes, these things are working mm. and functioning. So exposure is important. Mm, no, I totally agree. 
Look, uh, and look, as much as exposure is important, we might need to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're bang out of time. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Love your work. And again, thanks for all the amazing panelists for giving up their time today. Much appreciated. Hopefully we'll catch up in person sometime soon. Thanks for organizing it, Brad. No Cheers, worries, anytime. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thanks.